Let us pray to our great God. Our glorious God, we thank you that you are a God of truth. We thank you that everything you say is completely true. We thank you that all your ways are completely good and right. We thank you that Jesus shows us what you are like. We thank you that we can become part of your family by entrusting our lives to your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can now worship you in spirit and in truth as we follow Jesus. Amen.
My name is Kwong and welcome to our English lesson today. The three words we are learning are uh, Soapbox, Near and Overlook. Thank you, Ella. And the first word is Soapbox, a noun. Originally, a soapbox was a rough wooden box that people stood on while making speeches in public. These people usually spoke on street corners and they expressed their ideas with great passion and conviction. Usually, these people spoke about politics or religion. Today, whenever someone talks about a topic in a very passionate way, we say that they are standing on their soapbox. For example, when someone won't stop speaking, we might say, if you would just get off your soapbox for a minute, then you'd hear what I want to say. Example 1. At Speaker's Corner in London's Hyde Park, people can still give speeches in public on almost any topic they want. Some speakers still bring a soapbox with them to help them project their voice better and so that people can see them better. Example 2. Each week, Byron Bay's Echo newspaper features a section called The Manly D. Nolan Soapbox, where Miss Nolan discusses an issue that is affecting residents of Byron. This week, it was COVID trolley rage, where customers attack supermarket staff for asking them to wear masks while they shop. Discussion. If you had a chance to speak to everyone about one issue, what would it be? Why would you choose that issue? You have two minutes. Welcome back. Our next word is sneer, a noun and a verb. A sneer is an unkind facial expression that shows that you don't respect another person. It's a facial expression that shows you do not approve of them. A sneer shows that you have contempt for the other person and they disgust you. Usually when someone sneers, one corner of their lip is slightly raised and they frown. If you sneer at someone, then you think they are so foolish 
that they deserve to be ridiculed and made fun of. Example 1. Actor Sylvester Stallone has become famous for his on-screen sneer. For over 30 years, Stallone has paid, played the role of good guy, always fighting the baddies. And you can almost feel the contempt he had for the bad guy in the movie, Cobra, when he sneered, You're the disease, and I'm the cure. Let's watch Stallone do it. You're a disease, and I'm the cure. Example 2. Reporter Mr. James Marriott says that the middle class in the United Kingdom is moving back to the suburbs. He says that for many years, people sneered at life in the suburbs and called it lifeless, boring and monotonous. But as luxury apartment blocks and gyms take over the inner city, the middle class is now migrating back to the suburbs. Our last word is overlook, a verb. If you overlook something, then you fail to notice it. You fail to consider something, you forget it or miss it. You do not see it. Usually, this is not intentional, but an accident. Example 1. Mr. Robert Farley says that small nations around the world who are looking to buy a reliable attack fighter should not overlook the JAS-39 Gripen produced by Saab in Sweden. He says the fighter is small compared with similar planes. It's inexpensive to buy, around $60 million each. It's pilot friendly and it's the cheapest modern fighter jet to maintain. Example 2. Kate had been a loyal employee for over 10 years, but when a chance for a promotion finally came up, she was overlooked and the position was given to an applicant from outside the company. Kate was very disappointed and wasn't sure whether to leave or to stay and try again. Discussion Here are five things that people overlook. Which do you think is the most important? A. Being nice to other people even if they don't deserve it. B. Being polite to your elders. C. Noticing the little things in life. A child's smile. A flower. A gentle breeze. D. Being patient with people in lines, in traffic, in crowds. E. Being still and listening to nature, thunder, rain, the wind. You have two minutes.
That's it for the English lesson today. The three words that will help us with the Bible passage today are one, soapbox, two, sneer, and three, overlook. Thank you. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Gracious God and Father, Lord, open our eyes so that we will see. Lord, open our ears so that we will hear. Lord, open our minds so that we will understand. Lord, open our hearts so that we will obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's reading is Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting in Athens for Timothy and Silas, his spirit was deeply troubled when he saw that the city was full of idols. Paul talked about this with the Jews and God-fearers in the synagogue, and every day he went out onto the streets and talked with anyone who came along. Through these conversations, Paul got to know some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers pretty well. Some of them dismissed him, saying, What a moron! But others were intrigued by Paul as he spoke about Jesus and the resurrection. They said, That's a new teaching about the gods. Tell us more. These people asked Paul to make a public presentation at the Areopagus. They said, What you're saying is new to us. We've never heard anything quite like it. Explain it to us so we can understand. Now Athens was a great place for gossip, and both the locals and tourists spent all their time talking about the latest ideas and trends. So Paul went to the Areopagus and explained it to them. Paul said, It is clear to me that you Athenians are very religious people, and when I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the shrines I came across. And I even found an altar which had this written on it, to the unknown God. Well, I'm here to introduce you to this God that you worship in ignorance. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and he doesn't need human hands to serve him, because he himself gives life and breath to everything. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. His purpose was that people could seek after him and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since we are his offspring, we shouldn't think that God is like an idol which is designed and made by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but no longer, because he has now fixed a day on which he will judge the world with justice, through the man he has appointed as judge. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When Paul said, raising him from the dead, the crowd was immediately divided. Some sneered at Paul and left, but others said, let's do this again, we want to hear more. But that was it for the day, and Paul left. Some people followed Paul and became believers. Among them was Dionysius and a woman named Damaris. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, good morning and uh, welcome to church. Uh, today we're continuing our series in the book of Acts and we're looking at uh, Paul's speech in Athens. Uh, and if you, what we should be doing here is really uh, realizing that Athens back then. Uh, was a lot like Sydney is today. And so as we read about what Paul said, always keep in the back of your mind that his words would be very appropriate today. So let's begin by praying. 
Father, we thank you very much that you are the God who speaks to all people in all places. We thank you that you are very near to us, that you're there in every heartbeat, every breath that we take. And so we ask, Lord, that you will help us to see you this morning, to understand what you are like, and to change our lives so that we better fit in with the universe that you have made. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus into this world so that we may know you as you are, so that we may worship and love you and live as you made us to live. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, what is the most important thing about life? You know, what is the most important thing about you as you live your life today? Well, in our society today, there are many different answers to this question, aren't there? For example, some people would say that the most important thing is that you be happy in your life. While other people would say, well, no, the most important thing is that you just be yourself. Whatever you decide to be, whatever identity you want. Others during you know, lockdown would say, well, the most important thing is to be safe. It's, it's to be vaccinated. But then other people would disagree with you and say, oh, no, the most important thing is to be free, to be able to live, leave your house apart from those two golden reasons that we have at the moment, shopping and exercise. The most important thing is to be free. And friends, soon we will be. See, the point I'm trying to make is that that question, what is the most important thing in life? The answer to that question keeps changing. And it's been changing for thousands of years. It always keeps changing as our situation changes. But friends, there is one place, there has always been one place where the answer to that question has never changed. Because there is one place where the answer to that question has always been the same. You see, the word of God, the Bible, has always said this. The most important thing about you is the way you think about God. The most important thing about you is the way you think about God. And friends, the eternal word of God has always said this, because the way you think about God will always determine how you live. The way you and I think about God will always determine the quality of the life that we live. Now, friends, in our modern world today, I think there are at least you know, five ways that people think about God in the wrong way. I mean, there's probably more, but I just want to list five ways that I think people think about God in the wrong way. So here we go. Number one, some people think that God is like a policeman who is always waiting to catch you for doing something wrong. Friends, people who think like this about God are convinced that God is always watching He's always watching you and he's waiting to trap you. And when you do something wrong, wham, he will hit you over the head. That's how some people think about God. And friends, if you think about God in that way, well, you can't really relax around him, can you? You can't be comfortable around him. Instead, you will be very anxious and you know, guilty and extremely nervous all of the time. That's how some people think about God. Number two, some people think that God is like an old man in the sky who has a big beard, you know, he's a little bit cuddly, and he just enjoys playing the harp all of the time. And really, this sort of God is a bit like a harmless grandfather who just wouldn't hurt a fly. And now if you're having 
troubles, you know, trying to imagine what this sort of God would look like, well, just think about President Biden in the United States. You know, a very powerful person, but he just doesn't really seem to understand what's going on around him. And friends, the problem with thinking about God in this way is that when life gets difficult and when you're in the middle of suffering, this God can't help you because he's playing his harp. And he's totally unaware of you and he's totally unaware of your problems. This is how some people think about God. Number three, some people think that God is always angry. You know, some people, including some Christian people, think that God always has a frown on his face, that he's always, you know, demanding more. He's never satisfied and he's always burning with anger because people will not do what he says. That's how some people, even some Christian people, think about God. And friends, I think if you think about God like this, well, it will be impossible for you to love him. I mean, it will be impossible. And it will be impossible because you cannot love someone from your heart who is always angry with you. You just can't do it. Number four, some people think that God is unfair. You know, some people think that God treats different people differently. Now, if you think about God in this way, do you think you can worship him? Do you think you can rejoice in him and love him? Well, you can't. Because if you think that God loves someone else more than he loves you, well, then you'll just be full of resentment. But if you think that God loves you more than he loves other people, then you'll probably take him for granted. You'll use him. And friends, that is never a good thing to do in any relationship you have. But that is the way some people think about God. Lastly, number five, some people think that God has made the universe, but that he is not actively involved in the world today. Now, some people really like this idea because if you think about God like that, you know, he makes the universe and he just lets it go. Well, God's not telling you what to do. And some people really, really, really like that idea. But there's a problem with that idea. Because if God made the world and just let it go, and he's not involved in human life, well, if God is like that, then guess what? You are on your own. There's no one to help you. And life can be pretty complicated sometimes. It can be pretty stressful. But if you think like of God like that, then you are completely alone. And if you are completely alone, then it's all up to you. And that is a lot of pressure, don't you think? You will be anxious, scared, and you will suffer from what young people call FOMO, which I think stands for fear of missing out. And really, if there is no God or if God is not lovingly involved in human life, this is what will happen to you. You will be anxious, scared, and always trying really hard not to miss out on anything that is good. And friends, that life is exhausting. And it won't satisfy you. Not for long. Friends, 2,000 years ago, when the Apostle Paul walked into Athens, he walked into a city that was a lot like Sydney is today. You see, back then, people also thought about God in lots of different ways, and they thought about God in lots of wrong ways. Now, some of those ways were religious. It involved, you know, temples and shrines and incense, but some of those ways were not religious. And they involved things like philosophy, like following the teachings of the Stoic and the Epicureans, who taught people how to live their life 
as if there was no God in this world. Well, friends, how do you introduce the risen Jesus in a world like that? How do you introduce the risen Jesus in a world that is a lot like our world today? That's what we're going to look here in Acts chapter 17. So let's listen to how God speak to the people of Athens. Look at verse 21. Now, Athens was a great place for gossip. And both the locals and tourists spent all their time talking about the latest ideas and trends. So Paul went to the Areopagus and explained it to them. Paul said, it is clear to me that you Athenians are very religious people. When I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with the shrines I came across. Friends, 2,000 years ago, Athens was a lot like Sydney is today. I mean, just like them, we love new things, don't we? We love to hear about new ideas and we love trying new things out. And really, I think we love new things more than they did. Because with the technology we have, it makes it so much easier for us to share new things. But friends, it's so interesting that as Paul began his speech, he didn't condemn the people of Athens. He just didn't do it. He never condemned the people of Athens. Instead, Paul seems to understand that people's actions are always a natural expression of the longings that are deep in their hearts. And that's why Paul says, you know, I can see you are all very religious people. And what he meant was that he could see that everyone in Athens was looking for something more. They were looking for something more bigger and better than just their natural human experience. And it didn't matter to Paul if they were looking and seeking through idols or philosophy. What Paul could see is that these people wanted more. Deep in their soul, they were looking for more. They were looking for something bigger and better than the life that they lived. And friends, I think that is still the same today. People are looking for more. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is they're looking in all the wrong places. That is the problem. But friends, although Paul did not condemn the people in Athens and neither should we, Paul doesn't leave them there, does he? And neither should we. You see, Paul doesn't say, well, you guys just just believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe and that's fine. He doesn't do that. Instead, Paul opens his briefcase and he pulls out the good news of Jesus and he begins to tell the people of Athens about the God who is there, about the God who they still have not met. Look at verse 23. Paul said, and I even found an altar which had this written on it, to the unknown God. Well, I'm here to introduce you to this God that you worship in ignorance. Now, friends, what does Paul mean by this very strange phrase? I'm here to tell you about the unknown God that you worship in ignorance. What does he mean? Worshipping the unknown God in ignorance. Well, the heart of ignorance really is not knowing the truth. And that was the problem in Athens. Although people had, you know, big ideas and they were looking for more, they did not know the truth about God. And if you don't know the truth about God, you will never find what you're looking for. You will always be in the dark and you will always feel around and stumble and you will never find the God who is there. That was the problem with the people of Athens. You see, these highly educated people were a mixture of big ideas, big aspirations, big dreams, mixed with confusion, false ideas, distractions, 
and bad habits. And so Paul gets up on his soapbox and he begins to teach them as clearly as he can. He begins to teach the people of Athens about the God who is there and about the God they have not met yet. And Paul does this by teaching them three things about God. Number one, Paul teaches them that God is the maker of all things. Look at verse 24. Paul says, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples and he doesn't need human hands to serve him because he himself gives life and breath to everything. Friends, Paul says that the one true God is the maker of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. And if you're having problems trying to, you know, imagine what this God would look like, what he would be like, well, try thinking about the universe we live in. Try and think about how big this universe is. You see, scientists, you know, estimate, really, they're guessing, but they think that the physical universe is something like 93 billion light years in diameter which means if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take us 93 billion years of traveling to get from one side of the universe to the other. Now that's big. But if you think that's big, then we must realize that God is bigger because he made the whole universe. And because he made the whole universe, he made everything that's in the universe. And if he made everything in the universe, then he made you and me. And if he made you and me, then I think it's safe to say that he probably doesn't need you and me. You see, friends, Paul says that God is much bigger than us. You know, he's not like us, but just a little bit better or a little bit bigger. Now, the truth is that God is infinitely bigger and infinitely better. He is infinite in power. He is infinite in wisdom. He is infinite in goodness. And he is the only person in the universe and beyond who is completely free. He is completely self-sufficient. He is the only person who truly can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. That is the God that we have to deal with. That is the God who is there. But friends, if God is that different, if he's that big, why did he make you and I? Well, that's the second thing that Paul teaches the people of Athens. Number two, Paul says we are his offspring. Look at what Paul says. From one man, God created all the nations throughout the whole earth. And his purpose was that people would seek him and perhaps feel the way toward him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Friends, remarkably, Paul says that from the very beginning, God's plan was to place each of us in a situation of life where we would seek him. That was his plan. From the very beginning, that he would place each of us in the exact right situation where we would want to seek him. That has always been his plan for all of humanity, even today, even in your life. That is God's plan for you. Wherever you are, that you would seek him. And friends, I love the clear way that Paul teaches here about the nearness of God. You know, he, he says, 
in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, in him we exist. He's so near to us. He is around us. He sustains us. He gives us everything that we need. In him we live. You see, friends, God is very near to every one of us. He doesn't play hide and seek with you. No, God is near, incredibly near. In fact, he's so near that he's there in your very heartbeat. He's so near that he's there when you take your every breath. God is near to us. But friends, just like we can be totally unaware of our heartbeat, and just like we, you know, don't think about how we breathe, so too we can be totally unaware of God's presence with us. And so too we are free not to think about God. That is the universe that God has made. God gives us great freedom. He doesn't force himself on us. He is near, but he doesn't force himself. He gives us great freedom. He gives us room to decide for ourselves if we do want to seek him. Friends, that's our choice. That's the world he has made. And if we do decide to seek him, well, God, Jesus' promises to us is he who asks will receive. He who knocks, well, the door will be open. He who seeks will find. And they will find the Lord because he is close, as close as every breath, as every heartbeat. It is our choice. Friends, we will find him because he is near and we are his offspring. Number three, Paul says this, God will judge the world with justice. Look at verse 29. Paul says, and since we are his offspring, we shouldn't think that God is like an idol which is designed and made by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but no longer, because he has now fixed a day on which he will judge the world with justice through the man he has appointed as judge. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Friends, Paul says that God will no longer overlook our overlooking of him. Because the time has come for each person to consciously turn back to God. The time has now come for each of us to deal with God as he is. To repent, as the Bible says, to turn back to him. And God is so serious about this that he has set a day where he will judge the whole world in justice. And friends, we call this final day the day of judgment. Now friends, I think that many Christians today misunderstand what will happen on judgment day. Because some Christians think that, you know, the only thing that will happen on that day is that some people will go to hell and some people will go to heaven. But the truth is that a lot more is going to happen on Judgment Day than just those two things. Because on that day, God will set all things right. On that day, he will remove all evil. On that day, he will remove everything that stops us from being fully aware of God. And perhaps most important of all, on that day, God will give each person what they really want. That's what God's going to do. He's going to give each person what they really want. Either a life with him eternally or a life without him eternally. And friends, whatever we receive from the hand of God on that day will be what we deserve. Perfect justice 
if that's what you want. Or perfect mercy, if that's what you want. And Paul tells the people of Athens that God has already chosen a judge for this task. You know, God has already appointed the judge, and he's done this by raising him from the dead. And of course, Paul is talking about the risen Jesus here. You know, the same risen Jesus that we've been following throughout the book of Acts. The same risen Jesus who has been working through the book of Acts to expand the kingdom of God. And friends, this appointed judge, this risen Jesus, is still doing that work today. He's still doing that work in your life to draw you back to him. That's what God is doing. But friends, there's a problem with all of this, isn't there? And the problem is this, number four. The problem is that some people will not believe. Look at verse 32. When Paul said, raising him from the dead, the crowd was immediately divided. Some sneered at Paul and left. But others said, let's do this again. We want to hear more. But that was it for the day, and Paul left. Some people followed Paul and became believers. Among them was Dionysius and a woman named Damaris. Now, friends, this is the way that will always be. This is the way it will always be. Some people will believe. Others will not. Some people will smile. Some people will sneer. Some people will want to hear more, but some people, as soon as they hear, they will run away as fast as they can. Friends, that is the universe that the Lord has made. He has made a world where we are free to choose. And we're actually responsible for those choices. And God will honor our choices. He will respect our choices, and he will give us what our hearts desire. Either a life with him or without him. You see, friends, the Bible is right. It has always been right. It will always be right. The most important thing is what you think about God. Because what you think about God will always determine the quality of your life, both now and in the future and for eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you very much for this speech that Paul gave to people who were living in a society that is just like ours. So many wrong ideas, so many distractions and false gods religious and non-religious. And so, Father, we thank you for this, these words that he spoke that brought you into their lives. And we ask, Father, that you will change our thinking and change our hearts so that we would see you as the creator, that we would see ourselves as your offspring, that we would understand that you are so close, that we would understand that we have to choose to seek you. Father, please do this work in us so that we may be ready for that great day of judgment when you will divide the evil from the good, where you will remove all evil and finally make it possible for us to worship you and love you and to enjoy you with all our hearts totally focused on you and each other. And Father, we ask this for ourselves, for our family, for our city, for all societies. Father, please be kind to us. Show yourself to us so that we may be wise and good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, friends, as you can see there, uh, we have uh, one discussion question for today, and it's a very general one. Uh, what has God, who is near to us, what has this God shown you today? So with the people uh, you're with at the moment or on WhatsApp or by ringing one another, uh, talk about that for five minutes. Uh, you know, what has God shown you today about himself? How has he revealed himself to you? And then we'll pray after that. Enjoy your discussion.
Dear God, we thank you so much this morning for the wonderful message that has come from Acts 17. Your word, the teachings of Paul about who you are in Jesus to the people, people of Athens and also to us. We thank you, God, also that you are a true God, all-knowing and active. Active then, now and in the future. We also thank you that you are a relational God, that through Jesus we can have a personal relationship with you. We praise you that you are a creator of all things. We praise you that we are your offsprings. Again, that you made us and through Jesus that you saved us so that we can enter the kingdom of God. We praise you, God, that you will judge the world with fair justice. And we look forward to that day. We also praise you that in our unbelief that you sent your son Jesus and called us to be your children. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to draw near to you. We pray, Lord, that in these uncertain times that we will draw near to you even more. We pray, Lord, for the sick, for the vulnerable and for the lonely. And we pray that for those friends to know that you are with them and that you call them to believe you and trust you. We also pray for the sick and vulnerable and the lonely in our church at Campsy, that we as people of God will take this opportunity to show love and support and share your great message in our actions and all this for the glory of you. We continue to pray for our leaders of our country. We continue to pray for our leaders of the world that your wisdom will help them to make unselfish decisions, to care for people and to protect those who cannot protect themselves. That they too, in their quiet moments, will think about you and their humanity and who they are and who you are and their relationship with you. We thank you for the great message today as we continue to deal with this pandemic and as we continue to trust in you and remain in your love. I pray this in your great son's name, Jesus. Amen.
Friends, as we finish today, let's talk to our great God together. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you continue to trust in him. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Enjoy your morning tea.